Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Afghan Park border conflict intensifies, gets violent. Miseries of Afghan women continues under Taliban regime. And security forces eliminate three Lashkar e Taiba terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir. Let's begin the show. The intensifying conflict between Pakistan and the Afghan Taliban is a volatile case of soaring patron relationship. The Taliban, once seen as ISI's proxy for controlling Afghanistan and having given Pakistan great strategic depth, has now turned into a classic example of a strategic blowback. A report. Shaman Spin Buldak is the second busiest border crossing between Pakistan and Afghanistan. The boundary, which connects Pakistan's Balochistan with the southern Afghan province of Kandahar, is a key trade route through which large quantities of critical goods move in and out of landlocked Afghanistan. For decades, the boundary remained tense due to illegal crossings, frequent ethnic clashes, and scuffles between the security forces. On December 15, clashes erupted between the border forces of Afghanistan and Pakistan, resulting in one death and more than a dozen injuries. Only a few days prior, on December 11, cross-border shelling and gunfire had killed eight Pakistani civilians and one Afghan soldier near the same crossing. Both sides blame each other for instigating clashes. Afghanistan and Pakistan have for decades had territorial disputes at their border, and the Chaman crossing was closed for several days after similar clashes only a month ago. It is the locals who continue to suffer due to mounting uncertainty. Pakistan, Afghanistan, border 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 Pakistan expected peace at the Durand Line, the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, since the Taliban takeover of Kabul on August 15, 2021. Unfortunately, tensions between the two nations intensified since the Al-Qaeda leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, was killed in a U.S. drone strike in Kabul on July 31 this year. The Taliban government criticized Islamabad for allowing Americans to use their airspace to access Afghanistan. On the other hand, Pakistan accuses the Taliban government of doing little to stop cross-border attacks by Tehriki Taliban Pakistan on its security forces. The porous border remains an epicenter of TTP and Islamic State Khorasan. This is just part of the process. You see the uh, ceasefire agreements. Why will you agree to a ceasefire when you have the upper hand? You agree to a ceasefire when you do not have the upper hand, you see, or for optical purposes. Now, <coughs> uh, have you heard of any major Pakistani victory against the Taliban in the last year or so? Nothing. I only hear about uh, uh, the TTP carrying out attacks in Pakistan very little that they're able to do to the TTP. So I don't think Pakistan realizes what it's up for. And I think the TTP know exactly what they're doing. Pakistani security forces also frequently carry out attacks against terrorist hideouts inside Afghanistan's territory, which further strains the relationship between Kabul and Islamabad. Since the Taliban's takeover of Kabul, the Tehriki Taliban Pakistan has become more violent with an aim to impose Islamic law in Pakistan. The TTP and the Afghan Taliban share ideological roots as they both work together against the United States-led Afghan government. As the Pakistani government ended its ceasefire with the TTP, the situation on the Durand Line is expected to become more unstable and hostile, with civilian Afghans and Pakistanis continuing to suffer.
India has clearly stated that there is no place for an ambiguous approach while dealing with a global threat. It is an attack on humanity, freedom and civilization. New Delhi has also zero tolerance for narco-terror and it is taking several steps to fight drug menace. Highlighting the country's fight against narco-terrorism and drug trafficking, India has urged Interpol to create a real-time information system on the nexus of narcotics and terrorism. A report. India has been taking a stern stand on the issues of terrorism in the international sphere, which is also reflected in country's G20 agenda. It has assumed the G20 presidency for the first time and it will leave no stones unturned to counter terrorism. It wasn't long ago when India organized the third ministerial conference on countering financing of terrorism. The theme of the conference was No Money for Terror, which emphasized India's zero tolerance policy for terrorism. India has clearly stated that there is no place for an ambiguous approach while dealing with a global threat. It is an attack on humanity, freedom and civilization. New Delhi has also zero tolerance for narco-terror and it is taking several steps to fight drug menace. Highlighting the country's fight against narco-terrorism and drug trafficking, India has urged Interpol to create a real-time information system on the nexus of narcotics and terrorism. ड्रग गल्प कंट्रीज से आ रहा था इसके मालिक कौन है उनको सारे के सारे पकड़ लिए गए हैं फैक्ट्रियां सील कर दी गई हैं और उसके आधार पर देश के 12 राज्यों में रेड कर कर वहां भी कारोबार करने वालों को पकड़ लिया संपत्तियों को जब्त करने के लिए भी हमने कार्य पद्धति डिस्ट्रिक्ट लेवल तक सर्कुलरेट कर दी है इंडिया हैज ऑलवेज डिस्क्राइब टेररिज्म एज एन एग्जिस्टेंशियल थ्रेट to global peace and security. The country has stressed the need to address the double standards in countering terrorism and highlighted the specific challenges with which the counter-terrorism architecture is currently grappling. Recently presiding over the UNSC briefing, Global Counter-Terrorism Approach, Challenges and Way Forward, India's External Affairs Minister S. Jayashankar said, that there is a challenge to deal with double standards both inside and outside the council. India's remarks was a strong reference to repeated holes and blocks on proposals by India to blacklist Pakistan-based terrorists in the UN Security Council Sanctions Committee by veto-wielding permanent member China. Time and again, India has stressed that the world sees Pakistan as the epicenter of terrorism and it should clean up its act and try to be a good neighbor. You see, there are hundreds of terrorist groups in Pakistan, some of whom are very well known and have been indulging in uh, umpteen number of attacks against India, especially lashkar e taiba jesh muhammad jamaat ud dawa uh, and There are so many of them. And what they do is, whenever they come under pressure, whether from the FATF or from other international organizations, with the connivance of Pakistani intelligence agencies, the military, and the deep state, so to say, or sometimes with the connivance of the, uh, the government itself, uh, they are able to mutate themselves. They rename into a new group. And then they start recruiting people. They start arranging funding, they indulge in terror activities. India has focused on inspiring other countries to take strict actions against terror. It strongly believes that the world needs to unite against all kinds of overt and covert backing of terror. Moving on. Over the past 12 months, human rights violations against women and girls have mounted steadily. Despite that women would be allowed to exercise their rights within Sharia law, including the right to work and to study, the Taliban has systematically excluded women and girls from public life. In the latest, 
the Taliban regime has banned university education for women in the country until further notice. According to a letter by Higher Education Minister, Taliban have announced closure of all public and private universities for women. A report. Afghan girls crying in agony. They are devastated. As the Taliban has banned them from university education, they were not allowed to take exams. Since resting power in August last year, the Taliban have been clamping down on women's rights by barring them access to education and public spaces. In the latest, the Taliban regime has banned university education for women in the country until further notice. According to a letter by Higher Education Minister, Taliban have announced closure of all public and private universities for women. The latest diktat further restricts women for further access to formal education. The ban comes shortly after a large number of the women population sat for university entrance exams across Afghanistan. In response to the decision, several male students at Nangars University walked away from their exams in a show of solidarity with the female students to protest Taliban's ban on girls' education. وقتی که من صبح این خبر را شنیدم واقعا زیاد جگرخون شدم بسیار زیاد ناراحت بودم اصلا بسیار تو فکرم فراگنده بود به اینکه ما دیگه اصلا حق تحصیل نداریم حق تحصیل یک حق مسلم است که بر هر مرد و زن فرض است که باید کلگی این حق است که کس از ما گرفته نمیتونه وقتی که ما رفتیم نزدیک پنتون شدیم اصلا مو حالت را که یک محصل ببینه دیده نمیتونه سو وضعیت کرنجا را استاد بود و بسیار به یک وضعیت بد به هر محصل به هر دختر میگفت که برین دیگه به دخترها اجازه تحصیل داده نمیشد این سر روحی هر یک از محصل بسیار زیاد تاثیر بذاشت the Taliban, which began as a hardline Islamist militant group, had promised to respect women's rights when they swept back to power in August last year. After the horrors of the previous rule from 1996 to 2001, when women couldn't work or study. But ever since their return, there has been steady streams of setbacks. In March, the Taliban broke their promise to reopen secondary schools for girls. Two months later, women were forced to veil their faces as well as their hair. In September, Women's Affairs Ministry was disbanded and only last month, women were barred from gyms, parks and swimming pool in the capital. Meanwhile, criticizing the action, the United Nations has echoed similar worries by referring to it as another broken promise from the Taliban. According to the UN Special Envoy for Afghanistan, the Taliban's government's relations with the international community were harmed by the closure of high schools. The Taliban, what it is, it's clearly another broken promise from the Taliban. Um, we have seen since their takeover, uh, and it, also in the past months, just a lessening of the space for women uh, not only in education, but access to public areas, um, their non-participation in, in the public uh, debate. It's another very troubling uh, troubling move, and, and it, it's, it's difficult to imagine how a country can develop, uh, can deal with all of its the challenges that it has without the active participation of, of women and the education of women. Afghanistan is the only country in the world where girls are banned from going to high schools and effectively banned from political participation. Today they have imposed a primitive government with harsh rules, erasing centuries of female progress. The hardliners have denied millions of women the right to an education, fired tens of thousands of women from government shops and outlawed their businesses and various sorts of activism. A recent analysis by UN Children's Fund, UNICEF, found that prohibiting girls from attending high school also has a financial cost. 
costing the nation 2.5% of its annual GDP. According to UNICEF, if the 3 million girls in the current cohort finish secondary schools and enter the workforce, the Afghan economy would grow by at least 5.4 billion US dollars. However, it appears that under the current circumstances, their contribution is headed towards zero. Let's turn our attention to India's Jammu and Kashmir, where the security forces are on high alert. They are trying hard to finish terrorism in the valley and park back terrorists are being killed one after the other. In the latest operation, Indian security forces neutralized three dreaded Lashkar terrorists in Shopian district, including Latif Ahmad Lone of Shopian, who was involved in the killing of Kashmiri Pandit Puran Krishnabhat. A report. Park back terrorists, with the support of their mentors across the borders, have unleashed a reign of terror on innocent civilians in Jammu and Kashmir. Today, even as the people of the region yearn for peace, the state has been stained with the blood of innocents. However, the Indian security forces have done the yeoman service to the nation by way of successful counter-terrorist operations. In the latest operation, security forces neutralized three dreaded Lashkar terrorists in Shopian district of Jammu and Kashmir. Acting on a piece of specific information regarding the presence of terrorists in the Munj Marg village, Jammu and Kashmir police and security forces launched a cordon and search operation in the area. During the search operation, as the joint search party approached towards the suspected spot, the hiding terrorist fired indiscriminately upon the joint search party, which retaliated effectively, leading to an encounter. Police also recovered an AK-47 rifle and two pistols from the site of the encounter. Among the three slain terrorists, two have been identified as Latif Ahmad Lohan of Shopia, who was involved in the killing of Kashmiri Pandit Puran Krishna Bhatt and Umair Nazir of Anantnag, involved in the killing of Til Bahadur Thapa of Nepal. अक्टूबर में हुआ था एक कश्मीरी पंडित का पुरन भट्ट साहब का दूसरा हुआ था नेपाल के मजदूर का हुआ था थापा साहब का तो दोनों में इंटरेस्ट मॉल थे तो जब सोपियन पुलिस को इनफॉरमेशन मिला तो सोपियन पुलिस आदमी मिलके कॉर्डन सर्च किया जिसमें तीन टेरिस्ट मार गए थे तो उजे नदीर जो है ये लश्कर तेवा का है ये डेलगांव अनंतनाग डिस्ट्रिक्ट का था और दूसरा लतीफ लॉन्ज है सोपियन डिस्ट्रिक्ट का था the situation in Jammu and Kashmir has shown a considerable improvement, symbolizing a return to normalcy. The security environment has considerably shifted in the favor of security forces. The terrorists have suffered heavy attrition and simultaneously have not been able to replenish their dwindling cadres due to the effectiveness of the counter-infiltration measures. This has led to a sharp decline in the violence inflicted by terrorists. Counter-terror data reveals that the total number of terror-related incidents has come down from 417 in 2018 to 110 up to September 30, 2022, with 255 incidents in 2019, 244 in 2020, 228 in the entire 2021, and 90 up to September 30, 2022. The Indian security forces are framing strategies for uprooting the terror ecosystem to consolidate peace in the region. These sort of uh, random killings have been going on after Article 370 was uh, abrogated. And this is because there are the other people who were trained and who were picking up arms and all are now either eliminated or have gone underground. Now these people are those underground overground workers whom ISI has now directed to do these targeted killings of all non-Muslims over there, whosoever is there. This is just to give a message across and also to make headlines that Kashmir 
valley is not free from terrorism and now the challenge before security forces is to get hold of all these underground overground workers to ensure that once these uh, overground uh, underground workers are caught and put behind bars then only will kashmir valley be free from all terrorism and militants be it deadly terror attacks illegal drugs or manpower supply or radicalization of kashmiri youth pakistan has no differed itself from indulging into anti indian activities islamabad's decades long obsession with kashmir has led to deprivation of food and development in the country but despite its internal instability failing economy and international isolation the country does not compromise when it comes to funding terrorists and with that we come to the end of this edition of newsweek south asia we will be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent meanwhile do keep writing to us at nwsa@anin.com this is uzma jafri signing off on behalf of the entire production team of newsweek south asia goodbye and take care